everyone. And we are live. And today I'm with Anita Posh. How are you, Anita? Hi, I'm fine. Thanks. How are you? I'm excellent. I'm excellent. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming on on the show. Um, you know, I, I usually like to call out like right off the bat, kind of how we met or when we met and how we know each other. So, so just for the audience's you know perspective, um, they should probably know that you know Connie and I, uh, the lady behind uh, Big Give, we've been friends for a very long time, and I recently interviewed her, and she recently did a call out uh, on Twitter to me saying, "Sunny, you know, you're doing a great job. You know, you, you should uh, try and get more women on." There. There. And being a father to two little girls, it's always trying to figure out like, how do I get them you know, more excited? I thought, well, okay, what a wonderful opportunity. And then you responded to that, uh, that tweet and you were kind enough to, uh, to lend us your time and, and share your, your Bitcoin story. So I really, really appreciate that. And yeah, Anita. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. And yes, also thanks to Connie Galippi, because um, I did an interview with her about one and a half years ago. Um, that was mm -hmm. uh, some two months before I went to Zimbabwe. Uh, okay. for, to do a podcast research or a podcast story basically about the Bitcoin usage in Zimbabwe. Interesting. And yeah, and we were also on the same panel. She was moderating the social impact panel at La BitConf in December and I was at the panel. So that's where we met again, only virtually. I mean, I've never met her in person, which is sad, but I hope that, yeah, as we all hope in 2021, it will be hopefully possible again to travel. Yeah, and to meet yeah. people in person. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, I mean, even yeah, so Connie and I, we actually did get a chance to meet in person. She was so kind that she came up to one of my conferences up in Toronto a few years ago and and spoke yeah. with the audience, spoke with the audience cool. here. So, Anita, as you know, um, you know, one of my kind of goals, and I keep saying this uh, at the beginning of all my podcasts, is that. I know we're hitting all-time highs. Well, today is not not such an all-time high, but still, um, I, I find like the conversation around price is interesting. But there's just enough commentary around it. There's far better traders and smarter people out there that that love talking about that stuff. So I leave it to them. For me, um, you know, having been in the Spain since 2011, 2012, I really value the stories behind uh, the people that, that, that kind of help bring Bitcoin um, into the light. And, and I always say that, you know, the ones and zeros and the Bitcoin, all that stuff's exciting, but it's all just really, it's people, right? It's about people coming together. And so, so I find that uh, the people's stories tend to be very interesting, number one, and number two, uh, instructive and educational for, for a lot of people. So with that in mind, um, you know, some people uh, start with their parents meeting, uh, other people start with their first jobs. And, uh, and I think in a recent one, Idan broke that one and started with like his great, great grandparents or something, because he wanted to share, um, you know, really, really uh, interesting story in terms of what their family went through. Mm -hmm. um, so curious, where does your story begin? Again, I'm flexible, but uh, where would you like to start? <laughs> um, I thought I might start actually with my grandparents and Let's my, do it. My, oh, I'm my liking youth, this new trend. <laughs> my, 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 my youth, my youth, where I started to mistrust author authority. Let's do know? it. And I think that's a reason why I'm into Bitcoin. I mean, I think there are several reasons for that, but that's one of them. Like, I mean, I'm a born atheist, for instance, you know, my parents never went to church um, and that in a country that's very Catholic. So um, mm. it's, it's basically the one and only religion here. And we still have crosses in the school and stuff. Also, mm. we have many people who have other um, religious um, beliefs. And um, so it started actually in a way with my grandparents because my grandfather was uh, in the Austrian army in the 30s and in 19, or it was before the, third, uh, before the Germans came to Austria. Uh, so he was in the Austrian army because there were no jobs. He was, he was also a, uh, he was playing music on the streets with his brothers to earn some money. And then um, in 1933, the Austrian Civil War uh, started and basically you had two big parties, the socialists and the conservatives. And they, they started to really, like it was war and the, 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 the church um, gave a blessing or something like that to the weapons of the conservatives. And that was the reason for my grandfather to question this authority that for him, uh, he thought it's neutral, you know, because uh, religion should be neutral in politics. And um, that's when they exited the church, basically. And um, um, so I was raised in, in this tradition of 
a non-belief in a way, you know, I mean, I, I believe there's a global consciousness and something that, I mean, I, I tend to be interested in Buddhism, for instance, because it's a, a belief system that doesn't have this, always this punishing uh, upon it, you know, because the Catholic Church is very um, focused on your sins and uh, what you have to do to, 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 to be free from your sins and you have to believe in this hierarchy. And I think, um, yeah, that, that's a thing I, I never understood. And um, I think that was one of the reasons why I started to be a little bit also, I, I always felt a little bit like a misfit, you know, in school, everybody was Catholic. And everybody and I had when there was religion, which is obligatory in in Austrian school, you you have a religious um, education, and it's Catholic. And so I always had time off when the others had this uh, religion uh, hour in religion. And, and also I was into sports very early on. And so I, I went to sports competitions at the same time, my, my colleagues in school, um, my classmates had to sit in school. So mm -hmm. I, I, it was always a little bit different for me. And also with the red hair, you know, and being like a more this, um, how do you call it? A boyish girl. Uh, no, that's not the name. Um, I, Tomboy. I, Tomboy, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's okay, the okay. way I'm. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I always was that, and I always, I think, I, I had more fun um, to play around with the boys, to play soccer and and uh, others, and to go on my bike through the woods <laughs> um, instead of playing with uh, um, dolls and stuff like that. I never wanted that. I don't know where where this comes from, but I think from very very early on, I realized that there's a difference between uh, women and men in the way they are treated uh, in society and what they can do. I, I, I can remember my grandfather was then a policeman and I, in a way, I thought to be a policeman men of course is something <laughs> is something great you know because you you are neutral uh you 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 help people um so so it was a very uh, ethical um view of being uh, in the police in the way so so i got that that i was interested in it and i can, re can remember um i was six and i was walking with my mother through uh, mm. a little town where i was born and I saw uh, a so-called politesse. So in, in German, there were politisten and politessen. So basically, only men could be policemen with weapons and these nice caps and stuff. And women weren't allowed to do that. So they had to wear skirts and such a weird hat. And they were only allowed to fill in uh, parking um, fines, you know. And I asked my mother, why, why, why is it that women cannot do this? And she just said, yeah, that's how it is. Yeah. And I never understood it. And so I think I was always a little bit um, questioning uh, the system. And um, I think that's where, where I began to question the system as a whole. And that made me a little bit uh, open to, 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 to the learnings in Bitcoin or, or Bitcoin in general. And okay, so um, when, and also <laughs> I, I learned very early on that authorities can change their minds very fast. So a, like, let's say benevolent uh, authority can become uh, a beast very, very, very fast. And you never, and I never, I always had the feeling I, you, don't, you can't rely on something because things change so fast and you cannot um, 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 influence it, you know, because authority is so powerful. Uh, I mean, I experienced that as a child. So I learned very early on not to rely on authority in a way. So yeah, um, that was my youth in a way that led me also to, to become self-employed very early. I, I studied urban planning, so I'm an urban planner. Basically, I'm an engineer from the Technical University in Vienna. Um, but in, I, I finished my university studies in 1997. And that was the time when the internet uh, came to Austria in a way. So I, I finished my university and got my first email and internet connection at home. And 
very soon I realized that, I mean, urban planning is a great field and I think it's still very interesting, um, but uh, it was everything, it was too slow for me. And it's also a very politicized um, thing, you know, like, like um, the, the government uh, tells uh, people how cities should be planned in a way. And this is in general, okay, because I think in a big town, you need some guidelines or rules to, to build uh, cities that have um, a livable, uh, uh, have a great um, quality of life. But it was very politicized. So um, if you knew the mayor of a town and uh, you, it was also very corrupt corrupted in a way, you know. So everywhere where people, where politicians um, make rules, um, it gets corrupted in a way because people are open to get bribed and other things. And um, so when I learned about the internet and that I've, I thought, okay, actually that's much more interesting for me um, urban planning has such a long periods, you know, you plan for the next two, 10 years. And um, that was boring in a way. <laughs> and I also thought the, the, the chances of my career chances were very limited because basically as a urban, urban planner back then, uh, you could be a civil engineer and open your own uh, office, or you could go to, uh, let's say the Vienna administration and be a, be a bur bureaucrat. How do you say that? Uh, work for the government. And that was boring for me. I mean, the, the idea to do my life long, the same thing, I, I couldn't stand it. And so I um, educated myself much more in the direction of internet and multimedia design. And I started my solo comp company basically as a web designer in 1999. And from then on, I tried to be self-employed as long as possible. I mean, um, it's not so easy to be honest uh, sometimes, but then I changed into employment spec and uh, into bigger companies and was also the, the product manager for internet uh, stuff and um, was doing e-commerce um, projects, big uh, internet projects. And yeah, in uh, and where where are we now in timeline? <laughs> but I have so many questions. Yeah, okay. So, uh, but I mean, like this is fascinating. It's fascinating. Sorry. I don't. I want to. I want to let you keep going. But, uh, but yeah. But where are we in terms of the timeline, though? Like, uh, so in terms of all these internet uh, interests and the, then projects. The internet project started basically in two thousand. So um, it's twenty years now, and I'd say twelve years of those I was self-employed, and the other eight years I was employed. And um, so I had a small company with my uh, company partner and we were basically like an internet agency building websites. I, I mean, uh, yeah, and, and also organizing conferences, organizing exhibitions for artists. Um, we, in 2006, we founded a website that was basically a marketplace for co-working spaces. But in 2006, nobody in Vienna and Austria knew what a co-working space is. We, I think we only had one here in Vienna. Um, so we were very early uh, with this product, which was great on the one side. But on the other hand, um, we couldn't really make a living of it. I mean, we earned money and stuff, but we had to do other things aside. And in 2009, we founded a, an online marketplace for designer goods. So um, from for small from so products that were made handmade um, mm -hmm. and sustainable from small producers basically like Etsy, but mm. Etsy Etsy wasn't cool. in Austria Austria back then so we did Etsy. that, and um, yeah so I had a lot of e-commerce and um, experience, and I also got to know the problems with uh, traditional mm. payment providers. Because back then, uh, you you had to pay upfront to be able to have a payment provider. There was not something like Stripe, where you just you you register and you integrate Stripe to your website, and then you have your shop. Mm. We had we had to pay like I think 
I would say, 3,000 euros to, to be able to use it. And for a small company back then, when you're not, you bootstrap yourself, um, that was a lot of money and uh, a problem, actually. So, yeah, so that was uh, then. And um, let's say, let's see, when, when, when did I get into Bitcoin? Um, in 2016, I decided that I need some time off and I don't want to be employed anymore. I wanted to be self-employed again. And also my, my ex-company partner, she said um, she wants to do something else. Um, so I, I, I need needed... That. I need to, yep. I was going to ask you something. So <clears throat> before we shift gears and go into the Bitcoin story, mm -hmm. uh, do you mind if I ask you some questions about what no, we please. just talked about? Because go ahead. Because, uh, you know, like I said before, you know, most of the time it's usually like, you know, give us your backstory in 30 seconds. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm like the opposite. Right. So I, I want to kind of mm -hmm. dig into some of these these quite these things you mentioned. OK, so. Um, Wow. First of all, like insane. I'm surprised I'm still sitting on my chair. Like that was a, that was a really touching story. Um, just to even start with, uh, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. So you mentioned a couple of really big things. So right off the bat, you said you were an atheist, right? And so, um, uh, so, okay, so just on a personal note, um, you know, when people ask me saying what, you know, what, what's your religion? Like my, like I was telling you before the call started, my wife's Christian, my parents are Hindu, you know what I mean? My friends are Muslim. Um, uh, and, but when people ask me, I say I'm just like confused. <laughs> I'm like eternally confused. I, I don't even go as far as to say atheist because I feel that that, you know, triggers people who are heavily rel religious because that means you don't believe in what I believe in as opposed to I'm just like, I'll go to church. You want to go to church? Let's go to church. Like you want to go to, you know, temple? Let's go to temple. Um, but there's something there, right? Because you, you, then you continue to say um, that th you grant your grandfather saw this connection between like politics and religion, and and he had this like gut reaction that, that something wasn't right about that, right? And then inevitably, I think our story will eventually go towards how maybe money and, and state should be separated, right? But but just to kind of highlight on that first point, why is it? what what is happening here what is what is like if we step back <laughs> and ask ourselves about humans in general what is this condition called religion and politics like I, I can't help but feel and this is just me my two cents that it's got maybe something to do with wanting a dad to be kind of there or something i don't know i don't know like as an adult you know maybe some of our parents pass away or we don't live at home but i feel like these mechanisms were somewhat put in place to help us you know, feel like we're not alone or something. And um, I, don't, I don't know, but, but have you, it seems like you're someone who thought deeply about this stuff. So I'm just curious, like, where did, what is this? And then why is it that all these like super, super important things like politics, like, you know, like urban planning, that's like literally how our cities will look, how money supply, why are all these things essentially captured by the state? Oh yeah, that's a big question. Um... I mean, I think, um, I mean, I'm not an expert on that, but what my learnings are, you know, uh, I mean, religion came before states and government. I mean, we had religion and kings. Um, and so in Austria, it's where I, I know it the closest from, um, was the, 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 uh, now the connectedness between politics and religion always very close. And, um, I think that, uh, as you say, state and religion have to be separated, not only because there also needs to be a place for people like me who don't believe in a God or in a system that, that is like regulating your belief, um, but also for people who have other religions. I mean, how can it be that uh, the Catholic Catholicism is basically the state church, and what what about the other people, you know? And um, I think governing a country has nothing to do with belief and with uh, also values that come from another century from other centuries. I mean, uh, would it be for the Catholic Church and maybe also other uh, churches, then um, there wouldn't be um, <clears throat> marriage for gay and lesbian and queer people, you know? Um, and um, that's also one thing that sets me, sets me a little bit aside. I'm a lesbian person. So um, I learned very early on that um, 
I'm different in a way. At the beginning, I didn't know why, really. I, I didn't know the word lesbian until I was 19, yeah? So <laughs> I didn't even know that this exists, but uh, there, there was always a kind of a difference um, and uh, to, to, to the mainstream, to, to most of the people, because most of the people are heterosexuals, yeah? So that's, that's how it is. And um, so, if the church would still have this power, I wouldn't have the same rights or almost the same rights as all the other people. And I really don't understand why just because you love your, the same sex that you are a worse person or that it's uh, not allowed to be that you're together and stuff. So um, I think that's also one of the reasons why I think that religion and politics has have to be separated. And I think many people, it's just a guess, and but I hear it also, they, they need something to believe in, um, which I also understand because I mean, it's hard to realize that our existence um, started with a birth and it's ending with a death. And I know there are many people who will say to me, that's not true. Our soul lives on and something. And I would love to believe that. But to be honest, I can't remember how it was before I was born. And I think before I was born is the same state that I will be in when I'm dead. So basically, I don't know anything about that, you know. So, um, but it's a, a hard fact to realize that, that there is basically nothing that, that, that lives on in a way, you know, and I also, I don't have children, so I really have nobody who will like live on with myself in his or her mind, you know. Um, so, so I try to give back to society, yeah, to be, to be this part in, in, in the world, because I think we are connected and it's the purpose of everybody to, to contribute to, to this world in a positive way. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if I've answered that question. <laughs> I can hear you. I'm sorry, I muted myself there. No, no, I'm saying I, I don't know if there is an answer. Um, you know, it's like, it's just one of those things. Um, but, but okay, so let's go back to your story. Uh, you were saying, so in 2000, you said, when was it? 2016, did you say? When did you start getting into Bitcoin? Yeah, uh, actually into Bitcoin, I got in 2017. Um, mm. But 2016 was the year of uh, new orientation in a way. I knew I didn't want to be employed anymore. I wanted to be self-employed again, but as a solo uh, soloist and not uh, like I didn't want to do a startup or something like that. Mm. And I thought about, okay, what can I do? And I, I, uh, I was living in Salzburg um, by the time then I left uh, to Berlin and was in Berlin in 2016. And because I thought, okay, Berlin is the town where all the startups are. It's the European hub for uh, technology mm. and, and internet uh, stuff and things. And so I lived in Berlin in 2016. But the mm -hmm. funny thing is I didn't, meet or, or, or uh, the, the, the Bitcoin topic didn't um, show up in a way. Hmm. And so I then realized, okay, Berlin is not really for me. And I went back to Vienna hmm. and started an, a small online agency basically to do oh. online marketing and websites and uh, web shops for clients and also uh, internet con marketing consulting for internet technology basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, in April 2017, I went to a conference uh, and I heard a talk from Sherman Forschengear, um, who's a, I would say, blockchain researcher and she was talking about Bitcoin and blockchains. And that was basically the first time that I um, consciously heard about Bitcoin because I can't remember, I think early on in 2012 or 11 or something, I read about it, but it was presented in a way like it's, it sounded for me like a gaming um, a money. Uh, so not a real thing, you know, and I was never into gaming or something. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and they also said, it's like, I, it appeared for me to be another PayPal, another payment system. Mm 
Mm. So I didn't follow up. Yeah. And so in 2017, when I heard that talk, I was really, it blew my mind. How do you, I, yes, that's how you say it. And um, I immediately started to research um, Bitcoin, like the classic rabbit hole, I fell into it. And I still had to make my money from online marketing. So my, my interest in Bitcoin grew the more I learned about it and I tried to, I, I very early then decided, okay, that's the topic for me now. It's not online marketing and web design because I thought already it's boring. Everybody's doing it. Um, what does e-commerce actually um, do? You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not into consuming a lot. So I'm more uh, like, I like to live the simple life in a way, you know, reduce the stuff I have as much as I can uh -huh. and, and not buy so many things just to, um, um, hmm, how you say it? I think many people buy stuff because they don't know what to do. So they don't have a reason to live in a way. So they, they, when they are stressed, they go shopping, you know, and I don't do that. And, um, so for me, e-commerce, most of the e-commerce was something like that, you know, selling stuff, stuff that nobody really needs. And mm. so I, yeah, I got into the Bitcoin rabbit hole in 2017, in, I would say in June. And yes, from the, and then very soon I realized, okay, how, how can I build my knowledge? Um, and then I started to write the German Bitcoin a book for beginners and yeah that that was the begin basically wow okay that's fascinating so your first <clears throat> kind of foyer into the space was to write a book uh yeah it was not the first the first things were talks i gave um hmm. like i presented bitcoin and the funny thing is at the at the beginning you you think you know something but I mean, you know something, but it's very much on the surface, you know, mm. and I did the, there's a digital, a MOOC, a massive open online course from the University of Nicosia, uh, where Andreas Antonopoulos is one of the lecturers. And I did that. And uh, yeah, from then on, I, I grew my, my, I learned about Bitcoin more and more. And so I started to give talks about it to educate other people. And um, yeah, and then I thought I, I need a, a product, you know, uh, something that can scale in a way. Interesting. And so I did this book and then also a German online course. Okay, and what's the name of the book? <clears throat> uh, the book is just called Bitcoin und Co. Um, and um, Der Praxis Ratgeber für Anfänger. So Beautiful. That's it. So is it just in, in your language then or is it also in English? No, nah, it's just in German at the moment. I'm thinking of translating it, but I, I really don't know if I should do it because there is so much uh, material in English already outside um, that I wonder if I should do this, you know? Yeah. I mean, I don't know, I don't know what the cost would be or something like that, but I've actually, <clears throat> that's very fascinating. I'm just curious about, I just sort of selfish note, what did that process look like of writing a book? Was it like, super, like, had you done it before? Would you, did you have some handholding? Uh, was it easier, harder than you expected? Uh, I've never done it before. I have self pub. I did it. I, I self published it on Amazon. So, um, so I've self published it on Amazon. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. It's just like an option. You just go in there and upload a PDF oh. and boom, it's done type of deal. Yeah. In, in that way. Yeah. Cool. Exactly. Okay. So, so you need to research the different, uh, possibilities you have because there's not only Amazon, there are also other platforms who that offer that. Um, but, um, it's difficult actually to research the best option but I thought Amazon is the best way to do it for me and so you you can upload a PDF and then it's formatted you, you need to format it in a special way and then you can um, publish it as a uh, KD on KDP like um, as a Kindle version if you want to as a, a uh, yeah a Kindle uh, e e um, no, yeah Kindle yeah yeah and uh, as a paperback yeah. And so I did also the, I did everything actually by myself. So from the graphics, um, um, 
to to everything uh, <laughs> and with a little help from peers because i mean i i knew i'm i'm new into bitcoin or relatively new so i asked um some friends from bitcoin austria which is an ngo here and um, Max Tertinek, who's the CEO of Coinfinity, which is an Austrian Bitcoin exchange, if they would read it for me to give me feedback so that I don't say anything that's really wrong. And um, they were great. Uh, they supported uh, me here. And um, yeah, so the writing process was basically a learning pro process because I think if you write a book like that, you have to learn everything and you also have to try everything. So um, I, I began um, using exchanges, hardware wallets, software wallets, whatever. And um, yeah, so um, that, that's how it came together. And what's the TLDR of the book? Like if someone reads it, what are they, what could they expect to get out of it type of deal? Uh, basically, if they 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 uh, can read a little bit about Bitcoin in general, but I didn't write too much about Bitcoin to learn about Bitcoin because there are so many other books that only do that. So mine is more a a guidebook, really, how a t tutorial, how you what's the best wallet, um, what are the differences between wallets. It's basically if you know you want to buy some Bitcoin and you don't know where to start then I like um, educate you on the different uh, forms of buying Bitcoin from exchanges, what are non-custodial wallets, what are custodial wallets and all that stuff. What's the seed? Um, uh, why should I use a hardware wallet? Um, what's the best way and the fastest and the cheapest way to, to, to get Bitcoin in a way? That's basically what it is to, to store Bitcoin uh, safely and to use it safely. Interesting, interesting. Well, that's um, that sounds very relevant. Okay, so what what happens next in your story? So you write this book. Now you've got a product that you can scale. Uh, you've got all this knowledge. You know, you've got this internet experience. No fear in the world. You're ready to to go. What, what, what does the next step look like? <laughs> uh, no fear in the world. That's not really. That's not true, right? That never goes. <laughs> no, right? that no, nah, that's never no. Uh, um, no, the next the next big step actually was uh, that I met Andreas Antonopoulos in Vienna. Oh, wow. Yeah, he he. I I was I started to be a patron of him and he came to Vienna to a conference mm. and he always makes these um, meetups um, for his patrons and um, in the towns where he he's speaking or was speaking and I met him there and I already got that book and I, I, I showed it to him and uh, he said yeah great because I know how much effort it takes to write a book congratulations and I knew I want to start a podcast or I thought about starting a podcast uh -huh, uh -huh. and I thought okay now is the moment and I asked him if he would come on to my new show and he said yes and that was basically also a great start for my podcast because I think my first guest was Safety in Amos and the second was Andreas. <laughs> oh my goodness so you just knocked out of the park right to begin with. <laughs> yeah, yeah so so that was that and that kicked it off in a way. So unbelievable, uh, unbelievable. And the, ne the, the next step was um, that Andreas or Andreas team was asking me uh, after I said I would like to, I would love to um, contribute to his work and to translate his uh, work to German. So I'm uh, one of the translators of the Internet of Money uh, to to German. And, and and you know Andreas has a lot of um, great pieces of work. I, I think I have. Mm -hmm probably all of them on my shelf, but if you had to recommend to like a new listener where they can maybe, you know, just like someone who's kind of at the edges, that's nibbling, that's thinking about, you know, Bitcoin, wh wh which book do you think they should start with? The internet of money. Mm. So, and that's I a think small he, one, right? That's a tiny yeah, one. Yeah. Uh, I think he has now three volumes or four volumes. Oh, does he? Interesting. Already. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, yeah. And what is, I mean, when I uh, was reading through it, it was kind of like, it, it felt like it was a, a synopsis of all his talks mostly, right? Is that, Exa is that exactly. What it is? It's, it's a, a transcript of, mm. uh, of his talks. So you mm. basically can read through the talks. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, cool. Um, okay. So you start this podcast. How's that journey going? You know, when, what year did you start that in? 20? 
in 2018, in August 2018. And I started basically two podcasts, a German one and an English one. Uh -huh. But uh, recently I decided to focus on English because to be honest, um, there's so much to, to speak and to learn about Bitcoin um, that I thought I, I, I'm not able, I'm a, I'm a single person, a company, and I'm not able to do that in German and English which is a pity in a way, but um, to be honest, I'm more interested in the global effects uh, of Bitcoin because in, in this area here in Germany and Austria, most people are interested in the, the, the speculation uh, side of Bitcoin. And I think it can have much greater impact in, in Africa, for instance, or also in India. Yeah? And so that's what I'm more interested in on and I'm also I think Bitcoin is a global money and English is the global language so mm -hmm. that's why I, I also have this kind of fascination for English cool cool okay so how many episodes have you done and do you have any tips for new podcasters like myself <laughs> uh, um, I've done uh, 93 in English and Amazing. about 20 in German so now soon I have the number 100 in English uh, cool. uh, and the most interesting thing for me at the moment in podcasting is podcasting 2.0 I don't know if you've heard from that no, that's that's a concept from Adam Curry. Adam Curry was a MTV um, person, I think, in the. Oh, what does it mean? Um, okay, it means um, the goal for podcasting 2.0 is to build a podcast uh, environment where the podcasters can earn money with their po podcasts, but without having ads or sponsors. So basically, hello, talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so basically, it's an uh, and community and environment where you can get paid with streaming money, like Satoshi's Lightning uh, over the Lightning Network. No. So yeah, and Talking, it works. Keep so going. Well. Keep going. Okay, I've never heard of this. <laughs> You've mm, never okay. heard of that. Okay, now no. it's great. But you've heard of streaming money. I know I mean, Lightning. I know podcasting and streaming yes. money. I can kind of you know put together in my brain what that maybe means, but. Yeah, Please, it, it, me. it means it means pay as you go in a way. So like pay for the usage. So as a listener, you will be able to pay the podcast host while listening in your app. And you don't have to do anything. You set it up once. So basically you can say, okay, for one minute of podcast listening, I want to pay five Satoshis, for instance. And as long as you play the podcast in, in the app, um, the money is streamed to my node. I see, and, I see. Interesting. But you yes. have to do it through the app, obviously. So someone like me who's just uploading it to YouTube willy-nilly, it probably wouldn't work. You'd have to like uh, create Not, a bit of a walled garden or something. Uh, it wouldn't uh, uh, work now at the moment, but I guess... Um, that will be opened in the future also for oh, YouTube. Oh, I see something that's going uh, for it. Something like that. So no, uh, the, <clears throat> the podcasting 2.0 idea is completely decentralized and open. So mm. everybody can join, everybody can build his or her, her own podcast apps. Um, at the moment, you can use the Sphinx app. I don't know if you've heard from the Sphinx app. It's a, a lightning chat app, basically. So you can chat and uh, you have a chat group. So that's called a tribe. So my podcast has a tribe. And so you are in a, in a group of people who are in your tribe and they can listen to your podcast and you can also discuss things in the group chat. It's like a chat. And right. yeah. but, but, you know, the podcasting, though, isn't it like just the fact that it's like free and available and on the, like kind of available to everyone? Isn't that part of the magic? Like, wouldn't yes. like, how would people know that they want to uh, pay you for your podcast if they haven't even heard you? No. So the, the one thing is also you don't have to pay. So it's your free decision. Oh, if oh you it's say just like you optional. You oh. It's optional. Yes, it's optional. Interesting. Okay. But do you think people so would actually do like, it then if they don't have to? Like, I don't know. Maybe they it's would, like right? donations. It's like, like Patreon kind of, but like, yeah, it's, on, Patreon on, kind. it's like real time. Exactly. But you don't need the centralized uh, Patreon alternative. You have an open decentralized uh, chat app on the, on top of the lightning network. Um, 
That's the basic difference. And Wait, the even the chat app is built on Lightning? Like, it's mm -hmm. not just like an app that does chat but has Lightning mm -hmm. payments. It's, it's, nope. you're chatting on it's, what? Yes. I'm so behind. <laughs> I mean, I, I've been in this space forever and I, I feel like I have a handle on it, but every day I just like get surprised. You know, like you said, there's, I don't, I think it's like literally impossible to know everything that's going on in it's, Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, I, so I cool. it's, it's, <laughs> going it's growing ever ever more you know every day i hear something new and i can't follow anymore that's quite I, different to 2017 or 2018 or 2011 when the market cap yeah, was 50 I, million <laughs> I, I wasn't i wasn't there yeah. in 2011 um but okay so, so what happens then so i mean the podcast I, I, okay just on, on a personal i've been loving this podcasting thing i had a lot of people telling me what are you doing? You're wasting your time. Like, are you serious? Like, like your, your podcast don't go anywhere, this, that. But my, my goal is just like, I'll be honest, it's a bit selfish, but I want to have fun. <laughs> I kind of use that great. as an indicator. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> that I'm having great. so much fun because like, and the craziest and my gauge for like success at this early stage is, am I having fun? And am I meeting new and interesting people? So check on that one today, <laughs> you know, so, yeah. so I feel like I'm like one out of every 10 of my podcasts now aren't people like Jameson Lop that I met four years ago. It's like these, you know, people that just kind of hear about it. Hey, you want, you want, and then it's like these relationships are forming. And that was, I would say probably my main goal was I felt with the whole, co I, I do events like you wouldn't believe like thousand people in a hotel. And I wanted to take that same energy and and kind of like, you know, in the COVID era, uh, harness it and, and, and do more. Right. And so to me, it felt like the YouTube thing was just like obvious. And by the way, I, my podcast isn't even available on. I yeah, don't even load a, it everywhere. It's no, not I, a it's podcast. Not a, it's not a podcast. <laughs> no, it's basically not a podcast. What you do is a podcast or a video podcast. I should call it that. I should call it that. No, 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 no. Yeah, by the way, by the way, if you go on um, like whatever the podcast world and you do search maybe my name or FinTech Canada or something, I took a lot of my old um, like old uh, events that I recorded. I turned them mm -hmm. into audio files. It's a little bit cheating, mm -hmm. but I turned them into audio files and I had some help <laughs> to load them on the podcast world. And so I do have something out there, but the stuff I'm doing as of like two months ago. I'm just like, like you said, it's more like a bandwidth thing. And I, I got to like kind of, I, I can create audio files out of them and maybe upload them into like the whole, you know, so I get it in my podcast app and okay. all that yeah. kind of stuff. So I know how to do it, but I don't know. I'm just so infatuated with YouTube. Mm -hmm. Like a friend of mine asked me recently, he's like, Sunny, take your knowledge base and subtract YouTube from it. What are you left with? I was like, just like a blank screen. Like I got nothing. So that's yeah, why I, mean, I was like, I'm going to just laser focus on YouTube. But, but anyway, sorry, I interrupted yeah, you. Go ahead. But, but I mean, what if, if YouTube decides your channel is in a way um, uh, doing stuff that's against their guidelines and they take you down, then you've got nothing, you know? But for instance, my, my podcast feed, mm -hmm. nobody can take it away. I mean, they would really need to go to my uh, hosting provider uh, and to the domain registry and to say, okay, that's censored now, you know, and I think that's much, much harder than to say, okay, turn the YouTube channel off. Um, so, because I'm, I think I'm one of the only Bitcoin podcasters who mm. is doing self-hosting. I, I host my podcast on my website, on my domain, while most of the others are on Anchor or Spotify or Libsyn. But does your stuff also, by the way, I agree with you. Okay. Like uh, I, my only answer to your question is a, a laziness probably. <laughs> like I haven't, um, you know, I, I've got to get to all that. I, I just haven't figured it out. So I'd love a little bit of help on that front. But um, I was going to ask you what, uh, um, so when you say you're hosting yourself, you're still using something like an AWS probably in the back end to actually host it. No, or you're actually hosting on a oh. computer in your in your place or something. Uh, I, no, what I'm I'm not <laughs> using AWS. I'm using the web space from mm. from my provider. So mm. I don't have my own machine that's an internet server. I rent a machine at a big provider. Got it. <clears throat> yeah, of of course they could turn it off. Yes. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, yeah. yeah. And if you look at what happened to Trump last week, I mean, if they really want to come come after you, you're gone. Like you're done. Like, uh, but yeah. yeah, but yeah, I agree with you. I think I think yeah, I am a bit vulnerable now because I'm like you know beholden to the Google gods right now. 
<laughs> yeah, but we uh, all are in a way. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't. I mean, there's a lot of things I could do. Well, my my thing is I've been kind of focusing more on volume. So every day I release like a two hour podcast type of deal, or my goal is to release. And so wow. if I'm uploading two hours a day. And I have, you know, two businesses to run and two kids and life and blah, blah, blah. There's no way that I can, no. uh, you know, manage. So I just, I just kind of carved out like the least amount of thing that I can do that nobody else can do. I think that, you know, whatever, and just somehow get out of the internet. And I feel like if I'm doing something valuable, YouTube will tell me, as in like the internet will tell me type of deal. Um, mm. Of course, barring the the unforeseen circumstance where they just completely get rid of my uh, my podcast, which uh, I'd be screwed. But I do have soft files of everything on my computer. So mm -hmm. I could foreseeably upload everything up to something like what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, you only need to um, uh, do, uh, um, render it, like put, ah, use it as, as MP3 files and load it up into a podcast host. Yeah. <laughs> and do you do YouTube? Yes, like, your, uh, that's is... actually what I started. Uh, I mean, I have a YouTube channel for many years now, but some weeks ago, I, I started my first video interviews. So I publish now the video and the audio file. Um, which is actually much more work than I thought. <laughs> that's my point. Yeah, that's so, my point. So I chose the video because it includes both, kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's a good idea in a way. I started with the podcast because um, I was also very insecure two years ago, you know, uh, with my English and myself on video. Mm. And I, I had to grow into that. And um, But you only grow into it when you do it. So yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, cool. So anyway, so you and I probably need to have some side chats. Uh, I'd love to learn. That sounds fascinating, like chatting on lightning and having this. Oh, um, yeah. Okay, so what else? What else? Where where does your journey take you next, Anita? Good question. Um, so or is that I, is that kind of are you in the midst of? I guess you're in the midst of that journey to some extent, right? You're I'm still in doing the midst. Podcasting. I'm I'm in the midst of the podcasting journey. I'm at the start or early beginnings of my YouTube journey. Uh -huh. um, I wanted to do like more planned content because in the last years, my podcast was always like, mm, who do I want to interview next? Because mm. I'm also driven like you to, to get to know the people, you know, mm. in, in 2018 and 19, I was traveling a lot to the Bitcoin conferences to, to get to know, to know the people who do this stuff, who build it uh, in person, because um, I thought uh, that's the greatest way basically um, to build your own opinion uh, on something when you talk to the people who do it mm -hmm, <laughs> and mm -hmm. not only are standing on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. And um, so um, the podcast is my main source of income. And um, this year I want to do more planned content in the way, like have a content plan and invite guests who fit to the topic. And yeah, last Actually, year. Anita, have you have you also explored with the idea of when you said planned content? I thought I thought you were kind of going more towards like where it's just you talking to the camera and teaching them something. I, Is that something you do or you're thinking of doing? I just um, yesterday or two days ago, I published a tutorial how to set up the green wallet from Blockstream. Uh, yeah, I want to go there. I mean, I have a German uh, online workshop already um, that people can take. But it's also one of the questions, when do I all of that stuff, you know, because the day has 24 hours <laughs> Yeah. and, but, but that's a goal. Yeah. 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 You got to pick your battles. Oh, so, but I was asking you, so then what, uh, yeah, I guess, where are you now? You know, kind of what does the future of this like podcasting business look like? And, you know, what's next, I guess, uh, I mean, for whatever you want to share. Um, yeah, I want to grow this uh, podcast, which is, uh, Actually, if you do it um, from the business perspective and not only for fun, uh, it's rather difficult because um, there are so many Bitcoin podcasts out now um, that I tried also to position myself um, away from the who trading and the next billionaire is here uh, into the, the social impact stories in a way. You know, last year I made a special about Africa. I mean, I've been in Zimbabwe in February. Then uh, in autumn, I made six episodes about different countries, uh, Bitcoin in Kenya, Bitcoin in Nigeria and these kinds of things and um, so growing the podcast is one goal and yeah to to also um, build build a bigger audience um, who's following me for 
education and knowledge about Bitcoin. Are you able to share like how many, I don't know, like what are the metrics, I guess, that the podcasters look at um, in terms of, uh, I don't know, subscribers or viewers, mm-hmm. listeners or so, uh, what, what, so what the, kind of things? Yeah, sorry, the, basic, the, the basic metric for podcasters is the number of downloads. So how many MP3s have been downloaded from your RSS feed in a way? Um, which is actually not quite uh, a good metric because we can, it's not really possible to count it, you know, because you can count the downloads, but you don't know if the people really listen to it. And mm. you also, you don't have the same kind of analytics as you have in YouTube, for instance. In YouTube, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. YouTube's crazy. You can, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you can see when people, people watch, what they, when they stop and all 100%. these kinds of things. Yeah. And you don't know that from podcasting. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, so, and the, <laughs> the counting of, of podcasts, like people tell you, I have a million downloads. Mm. Yeah, but you don't know if this is, uh, like counted three times or something like that. Yeah, it happens very often that these are not the real numbers. Mm. And um, so that's the basic metric and also the subscribers, like uh, subscribers on Apple Podcast or on Spotify. Um, yes, of course. And is the YouTube- reach of podcasts, like when it's just audio, is it like, 10x the size of if you're just on let's say a youtube uh, type of deal like is it is it like just ginormous or is that like one percent of what youtube is like you know what i mean because i don't have much experience mm. i mean it, yeah like that, how because i know podcasts depends. are huge but like like for example when i watch joe rogan i watch joe rogan on youtube i don't think i've ever mm-hmm. actually downloaded a podcast like maybe on a mm-hmm. flight once in my life but i i always watch the actual thing so that's why my mind just kind of went towards like you know video and, and with zoom and everything it's just super easy that you could just hit a button and it's recording um but but yeah do you know like do you have an idea like is it like if you were to draw two circles like is this is like podcast audio like tiny and then youtube or is it like kind of the same or <laughs> But in general, I, I really don't know. I think in general, YouTube is bigger than, than podcasting, but podcasting is grown, growing uh, in the last years very much and it, it will continue to grow. But on the other hand, I mean, you only have a, a certain amount of time to be able to listen to podcasts. So it's the same as everywhere. Everybody is listening to Joe, Joe, Joe Rogan, but I think there are thousands of much better podcasts mm. than the one of Joe Rogan, you know? Mm. And and uh, now that he's going to Spotify, it will be interesting. Uh, he has this exclusive deal now, uh, and that's a walled garden. And Spotify is basically the Facebook of b- podcasting. So you have the same mechanisms there, like surveillance capitalism all over the place. And the interest in podcasting. I mean, there are many people like you who just do it for fun, which I completely understand. And... Um, but on the other hand, um, what, what it, it, uh, the, the fear is that podcasting gets inside a wallet garden, just like YouTube or Facebook are, you know, so, or Amazon. So you can't decide freely anymore or can't listen to it uh, free, for free uh, from everywhere. That's, that's the, the, like selling out podcasts in a way, you know. I mean, I think that, for for personal freedom and um, decentralized uh, open content, we have left four platforms in the world, uh, in a way, the one is email. Uh, Nobody can take that away from you. Uh, Then you have newsletters, like the grow of Substack is interesting. I mean, it's also a centralized platform, but newsletter and email are two forms of content that are not uh, walled in. And then you have podcasting, and now I can't remember what the fourth thing is, <laughs> uh, mm. but but it's basically the the last independent uh, content creation possibilities where mm. you don't mm. need a platform. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, I feel like I'm kind of taking this off on like a very selfish note because I have all these interests in podcasts. But let's maybe take it back to Bitcoin. Is there anything else you want to share? So you shared your story, kind of like you know uh, the background. You've shared um, the projects, like the book you wrote, the podcasts that you're that you're um, you're putting out there. And so, um, anything else you want to share in terms of like that before I get to my kind of my one of my final uh, big questions around Bitcoin? Uh... No, not that. I Nothing. Okay, cool. So, uh, wh- okay, so what is one thing that you believe to be true that most others in Bitcoin would disagree with you on? 
This is like the Peter Thiel contrarian question. Does, does it have to be a thing in Bitcoin or what Bitcoiners believe <laughs> in general? Because uh, I mean, what comes to mind is when I think about Bitcoin Twitter, um, um, I mean, I, 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 I really don't believe that you have to be a carnivore <laughs> <laughs> uh, to be a real uh, uh, Bitcoiner, Bitcoiner. Okay. and I, I'm also not quite okay with this uh, toxic maximalism. I mean, I, I would tell, I would say that I'm a maximalist myself in that belief that I believe that at the moment uh, Bitcoin is the only uh, cryptocurrency that really is money, and um, uh, in that I, I, I believe in Bitcoin. But um, I also believe in kindness and uh, like respecting um, the other opinion of other people. And that I find quite interesting because I think the, 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 the impression of Bitcoiners is also, I think many people believe Bitcoin is very libertarian and very on the conservative right spectrum, I would say. Um, and that's also, uh, uh, mirrored in a way uh, in, the, in, in, in all the tweets in Bitcoin Twitter. But I think there are a lot of people um, with other backgrounds too, like me, for instance, um, who really would like uh, to be neutral. And uh, the funny thing about this libertarianism in a way is that many people then do not respect the freedom of others, although they uh, say they are exactly for that. And that is something where, what I... What do you mean I'm, by that? What do you mean by that? I'm just no, curious. I, I mean, <laughs> like no, that. It's, it's silly. It's in, in my opinion, silly opinions, like uh, you can only be a Bitcoiner if you're a carnivore. I mean... Yeah, that's... Yeah. Uh, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> and uh yes uh, things like that i mean maybe it's are you it's a vegetarian not... or do you eat meat or do you eat both you eat a balanced uh, diet or because i like vegetables i got nothing against I, corn no, and I, you know yeah. cucumbers <laughs> no I'm a, I'm a vegetarian since i would say <laughs> two two years or something and mm. I, I i also try to live as vegan as possible mm. um that has um several reasons one of the reasons is that i'm not okay with the mass industrialization of of uh, or food industry mm. like how we handle animals you know uh mm. it's not okay um no. it's a death machine uh, and and i don't want to be part of that also it's a health issue because i think um in in most of the the meat you eat um you also eat hormones and other stuff and i actually don't want to eat that okay you could argue that's also in vegetables yeah i mean I, I try to to do the best what's the best for me and um I'm trying I, to see if I, I yeah yeah I was trying to see if I have a book so there's this guy named uh, have you ever heard of George St. Pierre He's no. like the best fighter of all time in the UFC. Uh, Sorry, I, you can tell probably that I do watch way too much Joe Rogan. Uh, but no, he's like the he's like the best fighter of all time or one of the best fighters of all time and he's Canadian mm -hmm. and his coach for mm -hmm. us um recommends kind of like this book or whatever that talks about um, essentially like how meat doesn't, uh, it isn't conducive to long-term health, like as in it's supposedly cancer causing and things like that. Meaning if your objective is to live a very long, healthy life, that, that meat night might not be actually that, that path. I, I on a personal, I, I eat a lot of steak. We eat steak probably, uh, three, four times a week. You know, my wife is from, from Colombia, so we, we really enjoy our meat. But um, in the future, if I ended up vegetarian, like in the far future, I don't think I would be so, so surprised. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't stop eating meat, for instance, because I feel so sorry for the animals. Um, I yeah, mean, I do, I've seen those but, videos. But, it's, but yeah, it's more the way we treat them and yeah. the way we kill them. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm not okay with. I yep. mean, if... if and you cannot really know if this meat or this animal had had a good life if you buy it because mm. if you buy it it says for instance it's ecological or biological i don't know how how you say the word for it so that it has been treated well you cannot um verify that so mm. i don't trust the funny don't trust verify i don't <laughs> trust the 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 food uh, industry 
So I rather not buy the meat, you know. If I know it's from the the farmer next door and he has cattle and that's mm. uh, <clears throat> from him and I know how he feeds it, I know how he treats it, I would eat it. I mean, Interesting. and I okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so you, I guess your contrarian belief was that you, we, we have, or maximalists tend to have, Bitcoin maximalists tend to have uh, uh, these like nuances. Like, uh, I mean, yeah. I, I find it a bit funny too. I, but I do think it's, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know enough about um, keto. Like on a personal note, I, I have, um, like I just run a lot of experiments, you know, on my body. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I find like, like I, I do a lot of uh, intermittent fasting where I don't eat mm -hmm. at all, right? Like mm -hmm. I don't eat my first meals at like three or 4 p.m. Um, and I, that's been one of the best things I've ever done. But like yes. when I sit down at three or 4 p.m. and I have a big juicy steak, like my energy level, like I can feel it. Like I feel stronger. I feel better. And so those types of things kind of make me go, okay, well, maybe there's something here. But then again, I, I try not to like, like I said, I try not to believe anything too strongly you know what i mean like whether it's exactly. religion food money even bitcoin like i'm from toronto like i saw ethereum be born in front of my eyes mm -hmm. um you know and, and due to a lot of my skepticisms and negative feelings i never rode that wave if you will and then i could have you know uh, i could have and then could have been very uh, profitable for me but um but but again it's, it's because of because i have like these really strong beliefs that i'm always trying to figure out how to not be so attached to them yeah, I think intermittent fasting, fasting, for instance, works really well. And I think it's a great method um, if you want to stay in shape. And also a balanced diet is, I think, the best diet. So um, everything that tends to go to extremes is too extreme for me, you know. I like, I like in, that. In, yeah, in, I can get with that. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so Nita, uh, by the way, this has been a fascinating, or for me at least, it's been a fascinating conversation. I'm so happy that Connie, uh, you know, used the internet somehow to get us connected. This has been great. Um, I, I do have a few other things I wanted to quickly ask you. So um, do you think much about AI? AI, artificial intelligence? If I think much about, no, actually no, 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 no. I mean, I... I I, on the side, you know, when I research stuff or, or watch videos, uh, I mean, I like to laugh. I, I like to listen to talks from people who are much cleverer than I am. Um, and I found uh, a person called Martin Rothblatt in the other the other days, and it's very fascinating. She she's basically the founder of Sirius XM. I don't know. I mean, Sirius XM is the satellite radio um, where Howard Stern is also on. And um, and she also founded a company that is refreshing organs, you know, so so basically they are uh, prepping up lungs from people who died uh, to to repair them in a way and people can uh, get these lungs if they have pro uh, need a transplant and um, she also has a project um, from her partner it's called Bina. It's a, basically an artificial intelligent um, being. So um, this, uh, this Bina is the partner of Martin and they, their goal is to live forever in these artificial intelligences in a way. And I found that quite fascinating, but I actually don't have uh, an idea how far we are with artif artificial intelligence. I mean, uh, if I see these, uh, how is it called, US robotics, these, these uh, robots, I'm, I'm scared. I'm getting scared, really. I mean, flying drones uh, with weapons or something like that, uh, that scares me, really. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so, uh, yeah, but... Yeah, I hope I hope we find rules without rulers in a way for uh, those artificial intelligence beings in a way so they don't kill us. Yeah, rules without rulers. Isn't that the definition of anarchy or something? <laughs> uh, no, it's a it's a speak. It's a talk from Andreas he held uh, recently. And I like that. The rulers, the rules without rulers. Hmm. Yeah, basically, Bitcoin is uh, ruling without rulers. Um, so it has its uh, consensus mechanism, and so you don't need uh, a hierarchy or people who who decide things for you. It's it's doing it neutral and uncorruptible. Yeah, yeah, I could get I could get with that too. I think. Um, uh, okay, so so. Um, 
what about what about this this concept called uh, Ubi? Have you thought much about that, like universal basic income? And by the way, I'm, I'm just for the record, I'm not a so I don't I don't consider myself like a communist socialist, but I do like to think about these like bigger problems that's facing the world. And like I have a Tesla that drives itself, so I worry about like what about all the people that drive for mm-hmm. a living? Like you know what are they gonna, what's going to happen to them? Like there's a restaurant down the road that's like a robot, like uh, that literally just serves pizzas automatically, and so. I spent nine years in robotics. My wife's a mechatronics engineer. So we spent a lot of time, you know, we have 3D printers and drones, not with guns, but drones <laughs> to take pictures of. Uh, but yeah, and so I do see kind of like this renaissance coming where, you know, a company, for example, someone like Elon Musk could easily hire robots to do, you know, a lot of their work, which they're probably already doing, right? If you think about it, Teslas aren't made by humans mostly, they're made by robots. So what happens when it becomes cheaper, faster, more economical for an entrepreneur like Elon Musk to hire robots and and not hire people or Uber to hire cars that drive themselves and not have to worry about humans in the loop. Um, You know, how does, how does, how does humanity react to that? You know, one is to do what we're doing now, which is like printing more money and taking it from certain people and giving it to others. I wonder if there's a more like free market based solution to like helping people. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm. Mm. So the first thing I want to say, um, there's a, I think it's a misconception maybe, but in mm. the, uh, in, in the USA, if, uh, people say socialist, they always think it's communist, but in Europe, there's a <laughs> very clear distinction. I mean, the <laughs> yeah. social Democrats are not communists. I mean, these are really two <laughs> very different things, you know, mm. and I always, uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's a good something. Point. Yeah, that, that's one of the things. And the other thing is, I mean, I, I consider myself, I mean, my roots are, are social democrat rules, yeah, uh, roots, yeah. But mm. with Bitcoin, I became more and more neutral in a way. Um, and also with the COVID crisis now, how our government in general is handling this crisis, I'm really, really disappointed. And it opened my eyes that this system uh, doesn't work anymore like, like it should, yeah. And coming back to the universal basic income, um, I mean, if you, as you said, if you look at the developments in technology, there are so many jobs where we won't need people anymore. But what are you doing with all these people? They have to live from something. So basically, there has to be a way uh, that they can, uh, on the one hand, have money to live their lives and um, also to consume, because who is buying the Teslas if people don't have money? And um, also, actually, I think this... Uh, progress in technology is a great thing because we would be free from this slave-like work in 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 factories and stuff you know so we would have time uh, to to do what we really want to do like uh, being creative um, inventing new stuff um, taking care of of the people around us um, Mm. going back to the things we do not for money but just for Mm. contribution and joy and uh, inner growth I mean today there's almost nothing left that you just do where you don't have to earn you know because Mm. uh, with our uh, financial system we, we have to earn more earn more earn more because we are basically uh, paying back the loans we take up and the bank is uh, just uh, putting it in a ledger, you know, so everything is commodified already. So I think actually the fact that machines will replace people is a great thing, (laughs) but um, we need to have a mechanism uh, that keeps people on the other hand uh, on top and gives them money and and a way to live their lives yeah because and maybe otherwise... maybe maybe bitcoin is that uh you recently max said because in my interview i think i asked him about this too and he said he recently tweeted he said ubi is kind of like a bad idea but what about universal bitcoin millionaires what if everybody just <laughs> yeah, became the... a bitcoin millionaire or something i don't know maybe yeah. that's our our way to fight this renaissance i don't know what do you think yeah i think i mean The idea that Bitcoin is fairly distributed um, is a nice idea. And I I agree when you say it was open for everybody all the time. Everybody could have used it. But 
many people can't because they simply don't have the technology. They didn't have it back then. They have it not now. Um, uh, and they don't have the knowledge to use it, use it. And they also, they don't even have $5 that they can spare to buy, to, to stack sets, you know? They can't buy Satoshis because they don't have the money. So how do we get to a universal basic millionaires? How, how, how mm -hmm. was it called? Um, when, when even now, we are the privileged people, we are able to use Bitcoin at the moment, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, what I like about the Bitcoin space is that the, the whales in a way, uh, the OGs, I think they give back and people in ge general give back. I think you said before, who would like to, who would pay you for your podcast if it's for free? I mean, and I think especially in the Bitcoin space, there are people who are doing that. Um, so... You, have you heard of uh, uh, um, uh, the pineapple fund? Yes, exactly. That's, yeah, for yeah. instance, a, a, an example of that, yeah? Yeah, I agree. And, and I think, I mean, even myself, I always say that the best way to, um, to get people excited about Bitcoin is just to give them Bitcoin. Like the number mm -hmm. of people I've given even one full Bitcoin to is ridiculous. And now you think they're <laughs> pessimists anymore? Hell no, because they literally have an asset in their hand that's gone from 10 bucks to 50,000 or 30,000, whatever it is. Um, so I think that's a great, I think that's a great way. Um, another thing that comes to mind, uh, and I talk about this way too much, I got to get Yanni on this show, but Yanni is the founder of eToro, Colored Coins. He's like one of the, I think one of the smartest people in the world. Mm -hmm. He, I was at the, I was in Paris last year um, at the OECD conference. It's like mm -hmm. uh, regulators of regulators, like the, 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 and, and one of the keynote speeches was given by Yanni and he talked about something called the good dollar project, which is essentially Ubi on top of Ethereum. And, uh, and it can be built on top of Bitcoin similarly, but it, it, it it's, it's an interesting project. I don't think it's maybe fully there yet, um, but I think it's like the first kind of inklings, at least for me, that shows that, whoa, wait, hold on. Like we could potentially do this. Like, and it doesn't mm -hmm. need to be dependent on the state. Like we can figure out a way to distribute um, maybe Bitcoin, right? Maybe instead of dollars, like we can get Bitcoin, like Satoshi's in the hands of people. Cause then if it's even a little amount due to the nature of how it works, it might turn out being lots. I don't know, but I agree with you. I think there's a lot of limitations like technologically speaking and et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Yeah, but I would love to see it actually, because I think not everybody has the same chances. I mean, just uh, look from the geographical standpoint, also from the gender standpoint. Um, um, so, so it's not true to say, oh, I mean, I read that in the last weeks, it was about the Coinbase uh, structure that they, that guys earn much more there than women. And somebody said, um, yeah, but if gender is fluid, then uh, everybody has the same chances. And the person who can negotiate better will earn more or is better will earn more. And I say, I think that's completely wrong because um, women or colored people don't have the same chances at the beginning. So how, how do you ever want to level up like that? I mean, you can work yourself crazy and you will never have the same chances in a way because uh, the, the, the image of society um, um, prevents you. Um, we, we have so many stereotypes uh, that it's hard to, to, to break them, you know, and, mm. and why do you think are there like 90% men in Bitcoin and 10% women or something like that? Yeah. It's, my, 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 Anita, I was gonna say my last interview was with a girl named Preeti. <clears throat> she used to work for mm -hmm. Goldman Sachs and, and Coinbase mm -hmm. and A16Z and she's an Indian woman and, and she didn't buy into that, that narrative of, you know, mm -hmm. how women are, she, I think she was their second engineer. Um, and, and Balaji, mm -hmm. I think is one of their, why was their CTO is also a Brown guy. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and I'm probably, I've probably said more negative things about Coinbase than anybody else out there, but I, I, I don't know. I like to, not, yeah, yeah, but I, I know what you're I saying though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I don't mean it's uh, Coinbase, especially, I mean, it's also in, Others. in all the tech uh, space and yes, of course, there are always women who say it's not true because uh, they they maybe didn't feel it or they they had another upbringing or, or mm. whatever and um, I understand that too yeah but in general I, I I'm quite sure that that is true because there was also an experiment mm. experiment for instance um, that was on BBC I saw that once and uh, there were um, 
like they brought in people who were not the parents of a child and the child was dressed neutral. So it was like one year, or one and a half, and you couldn't know from the face, it's a, mm. is it a boy mm. or a girl. Mm. And so they dressed a boy as a girl, for instance. And uh, the people who were taking care of this child, when the, the boy was looking like a boy, they gave him a machine to play. If it was a girl, they gave the, him a, her a, a, to, a, a doll. And then they said, you know, that's not a girl, it's actually a boy. And people were like, oh my God, I gave her the wrong thing or him the wrong thing, you know? So mm. it's us, mm. our stereotypes. We mm. give them the, 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 the doll or the machine, you know? And mm. so we grew up in that belief that Dolls are for girls and machines are for boys. And I think that's the problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I totally, I totally see what you're saying. I agree with that. It's just, I, I sometimes want to, because I, like I told you, I got two little girls at home mm -hmm. and I try and, you know, observe them and try not to force anything upon them, but... Mm -hmm they don't dig the guy stuff as much <laughs> they, they, they have they love the i mean like yeah, i said i i try and buy like you know toys and like like but m mind you mind you mind you one thing i do notice is my my older girl she's like she's really into uh, I, what i would maybe have considered like more guys things but she's super into them like lego like puzzles and she's mm -hmm. super good at them um, mm -hmm. but she also plays with dollhouses and everything, right? It's like, like you said, maybe, maybe everything in moderation. Like I like playing with dolls. Yeah, <laughs> Me and okay. my kids I had mean, little. <laughs> it's, it's completely okay. Um, but I think it leads to this, uh, differences in the world. I agree. Stuff, I yeah. agree. Um, okay. So what other, what other, anything else? Oh yeah. My last question. Anything that you wish I would have asked that maybe I didn't <laughs> about you, Bitcoin projects, oh, current events? No, no, I think don't. Think no. So. Okay, Nina, so where do where do people find out about you if they wanna um your you know your podcast, your book, your your kind of flow of thought? Is there like a Twitter handle? Where do you blog, okay. your website, yep. all that stuff if so, you can help. So the Twitter handle is Anita Posh. Mm -hmm. uh, that's P O C H uh S-C-H with an C and yeah. also my website is anitaposh.com and there you find all the information you need and yeah. Amazing. I also have a weekly newsletter every Friday with the best stories in Bitcoin from my point of view. And, and you know, g given that my, I'm kind of calling this building on Bitcoin, like I said, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm trying to get people to think less about like, oh, just it's an investment. It's going mm -hmm. up and I'm NGU yeah. and more about, look, there's a bunch of people who actually make a living or are trying to make a living or building on it in a way where, you know, they're doing this full time. And so to those out there, uh, Anita, that are, you know, a bit on the, on the fence, maybe you in 2017 that are going, okay, this is definitely something I want to dedicate more time and energy and money to. Do you have any, I don't know, parting words for them? Yeah, I think building on Bitcoin is a great name uh, because that's actually why I'm here. I'm also not here because of the trading and speculation. Mm. I'm, I'm interested in the technology, what it can do. And I, I always was a builder in a way. So like that podcasting 2.0 stuff, you know, it's, it's really on the edge. It's something completely new. And I think that uh, the best investment in Bitcoin is learning about it because there are also so many new jobs uh, that are coming with in, in, in this new space, are created in this new space. Um, uh, that's, that's really a chance for many people to earn a living and have a very fascinating um, uh, environment to, to work in. So I think the best investment is learning. Love it. I, I couldn't agree more. I think, yeah. I think I think that 100 percent agree. Um, uh, if there's anyone in your circle, Anita, that you want me to kind of do this story thing with, uh, let me know. Um, mm -hmm. But you know what? Once again, I really, really appreciate you coming on, sharing your story. It was I had goosebumps for most of it. So I'm sure people will really, really enjoy um, you know hearing about it. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I thank uh, for the invitation and that you're doing this. Um, it, I enjoyed it a lot. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to bring it to a close. Just stick around for a second here.